clearly the work of a poet, beautifully and most deliberately written, and offers a powerful and poignant portrait of a world and of a way of life only just past. Here commemorated are family, friends, neighbours from Patrick's home place near Loch Ray. Congratulations, Patrick. When Patrick's agent, Jonathan Williams, first showed us the manuscript of the Hurley Maker's Son a little over a year ago, myself and Owen immediately recognised that we had something very special on our hands. It's a rare thing to find a memoir written so beautifully with such a deep, intense sense of love, <coughs> love of nature, love of craft and machine, love of language and poetry, love of freedom and tradition, and above all, love of family. As Brian mentioned, um, love was a word we didn't say much, but love was very much present in our house. Now, when, when love got to be spoken, as it did only once in my recollection as a child, it, it had hilarious consequences, and some of them were quite, quite fraught and dangerous. So bear with this story. <clears throat> One morning, when I was about nine, the fire wouldn't catch. My mother had followed her usual routine, lighting a bundle of shavings around which wood chips and sods of turf were stooped. But after the initial blaze up, the fire refused to take. The chimney sent buckling billows of smoke back to hang about the mantelpiece. The black grate looked surly now, and so did my mother. It's those blasted jack dolls, she said, getting heavily to her feet and letting the fire shovel clatter from her hands. Are you sure it's the jack dolls? My father asked. Why, she said, am I expected to do everything? You all think so much of bothering to arrive down for your breakfasts. Do I have to eat the food as well? And then she said, mightn't the best way to make out about the blocked chimney be for someone to go up on top of the roof and find out? <laughs> he didn't answer, but he walked out to the shed and we traipsed after him. He lifted the sturdy pine wood ladder and placed it against the house. It reached only as far as the eave shoots, so he got that much lighter slating ladder and climbed with it slung across his shoulder up the big ladder towards the eaves. We stood staring after, against the sunlight and the thin blue air, while my mother, overcoming her annoyance, held the foot of the big ladder for fear it might slip. <laughs> when my father neared the top, he placed the slating ladder along the incline of the roof and climbed again until he had reached the chimney stack. We could see him there, hugging the house, delving his arms as far as the oxter down into the chimney vigorously rooting until his head and shoulders had all but disappeared. <laughs> Thank you, Klaus. Maybe you'll find an echo, I joked, thinking of the echo in Haas chimney, whose clean, high voice always sounded back across the fields to us when we shouted, Toby, the name we'd chosen for it after coming to regard it almost as a living presence. There's no echo to find, my mother said. That's foolish talk. Suddenly a nest of twigs rolled rattling down the slates. Then my father tossed down tufts of moss, together with more loose sticks and a faded red cardigan that the jackdaws must have pilfered from the clothesline. <laughs> he stooped to bowl an egg towards us, towards us, but he gathered pace and did a little bounce that took it past the eaves and it broke at our feet, leaving an orange smear and fragments of pale blue shell that had blackish markings all over them. When I looked up again, he was standing on the wide chimney wall. He began to dance. Clip, click, clip, click, a hobnailed quick step. He waved his hands about. He clasped them on top of his head. I saw the grin plastered across his face as he danced. I always loved the entertainments he put on for us. They happened but seldom and never seemed planned. And now there he was putting on another one. Somehow, in separating him from his work, his hijinks helped free me from any expectations he might have of me as well. What's he up to? My mother wondered, trying to crane her neck while she stood minding the ladder. He's dancing. Come down out of that, she shouted, stepping away and waving the goosewing duster she had taken from the fireplace. You're frightening the children. <laughs> now, all of us shouted, 
but our pleadings didn't seem to be tall enough. He kept on dancing. In fact, he laughed and then danced all the faster. I'll come down, he shouted to my mother, as soon as you tell me you love me. <laughs> love was a word our family just didn't use ever. Hearing my father use it now was even stranger to me than the fact that he had chosen to dance on top of the chimney before saying it. <laughs> my mother flinched as if she'd been hit. He's cracked as a bottle, she said, <laughs> and again shouted for him to come down. Has he no shame? Why is he upsetting everyone? <laughs> it dawned on me that he was dancing for her, not for us. He was playing a game, except parents weren't supposed to play games, never mind risky games with each other. All he did was ask again, as insistent now as Toby's echo, and loud enough for a Haas house and Hagney's house and Mrs. O'Reilly's house and maybe every one of the neighbor's houses to hear. He wouldn't quit and we turned towards my mother, asking her to please make him stop. I do, she said in a quiet, defeated way at last. And when he still asked, she said, I do, more loudly, and he stopped. If she had waited a moment longer, she might have won the game, for suddenly smoke rose in a crooked coxcomb from the chimney, causing my father to crouch away from it onto the slating ladder and begin his descent. We all clutched the pine wood ladder to make sure it was solid, but my mother's face was wreathed in redness. The fright was over, we agreed. He's coming down. But as he stepped onto the top rung of the heavy ladder, his foot slipped, and after a brief wrestle, he lost his balance. I saw his arm flail, and still he was falling, in what I can only describe as slow motion, though there was no time for us to shout out or do anything other than gape. Then an amazing thing happened. He swung his hand onto the metal pipe that angled out from the wall, and his grip held long enough for the pipe to break his fall, so he was able to twist acrobatically avoiding the water barrel and landing in front of us with the clang of his hobnailed boots. My mother looked bewildered, even lost. She clutched his arm against her stomach and chest. You're a very foolish man, she said, <laughs> and he looked at her and seemed to agree. Our parents never kissed or embraced in front of us because, as my mother would inform me many years afterwards, such things weren't intended for public consumption. <laughs> nor indeed did they kiss or embrace now, but he gathered us into a general grip, and a look passed between the pair of them that I knew only to be adult and fierce. When we went indoors, the fire had set itself cheerfully ablaze, and its smoke funneled straight up the chimney. My mother sat watching the flames, and her face and hands and everything about her seemed to shine. Amen.